thank you for attending uh, this uh, this class. Um, I want to try to keep it uh, keep the slides um, fairly short and have an opportunity for some discussion and some questions. Um, so uh, I'll I'll um, uh, if you if you uh, have a uh, if you'll save your questions to the end. I think we should have you know plenty of time at at, uh, at that point to uh, that to discuss things. Um, I'll just uh, start by uh, saying that um, uh, what I'm going to be presenting today is uh, kind of uh, my own um, uh, personal interest in hydrogen for, from renewable electricity, or at least my personal perspective on it. Uh, I wanted to share a few developments that I think are interesting from the point of view of, um, of science and technologies that can enable um, uh, hydrogen uh, production from renewable electricity uh, uh, in a way that uh, could be economically viable and also have some um, important uh, implications for um, for the future uh, uh, decarbonized economy. So um, I'm uh, affiliated with um, uh, several different organizations at Stanford. I'm a professor in the uh, Department of Material Science and Engineering. Um, I'm also a professor of photon science, um, so I'm a faculty member at SLAC as well as on campus, uh, and I'm director of the uh, Stanford uh, Synchrotron Radiation Light Source, which is a major scientific user facility uh, at SLAC and at Stanford. Um, and I also am a, I'm a senior uh, fellow of the Precord Institute for Energy, so, so I've been involved with the Precord Institute for uh, many years, um, initially uh, helping Precord Institute um, develop an industrial affiliates program, a way to um, better interact, or one way to better interact with industry uh, in, in the um, sort of green energy space. So, um, just to say a little bit about uh, the um, my current uh, job at uh, at SLAC, uh, the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source. Uh, is, uh, as I said, a, a major facility. We have about 140 staff. Um, there are a large number of postdocs and students from, um, from Stanford who come and do research at SSRL, um, either as, uh, as users, so they submit user proposals like um, people all around the world do to use our facility, uh, or they may um, uh, become involved as collaborators with our staff uh, and with uh, some of the uh, uh, faculty at, at SLAC. So um, as, uh, as graduate students uh, get involved in research and have advisors on campus, they often develop these kinds of collaborative um, uh, relationships. Uh, so this is a, a facility where we, uh, we have a particle accelerator. It accelerates electrons at close to the speed of light. And by uh, jiggling those electrons in a, in a a uh, strongly varying magnetic field, uh, we can produce um, uh, X-rays at uh, 32 different experimental stations around this, this ring. And those X-rays vary in energy and uh, intensity, uh, and they're used in many different kinds of experiments uh, involving spectroscopy, X-ray scattering and diffraction, and imaging. Uh, an example of the kind of work that we do at SSRL that are, uh, that's related to energy, just a couple uh, examples uh, shown in these schematics, uh, are things like um, operando studies of battery materials. So within a battery, within the, the layered structure of the cells inside a battery, there are uh, micro and nanoparticles, and as, these, uh, as the battery uh, is charged and discharged, uh, ion intercalation and deintercalation events occur in these particles, and um, it's possible to study these things using synchrotron radiation um, to obtain chemically sensitive images um, uh, without having to destroy the battery. So with uh, designing the cell appropriately, we can actually look at the process of ions going in and out of these materials, the expansion and contraction, and other uh, mechanical effects that occur. Um, another application for synchrotron radiation is in, uh, in catalysis, so uh, being able to study how uh, molecules interact with uh, the surface of nanoparticle catalysts and how they bind to that surface uh, by looking at the electronic signature of that binding, so looking through spectroscopy at the, um, the details of their electronic structure as the molecules 
uh, touch down and bind to various sites on, um, on catalysts can give insights into how the catalysts actually work, what are the active sites, how can we synthesize better catalysts that are more active. Uh, so there's a learning circle that's, that's depicted here uh, going from synthesizing the catalysts, characterizing them, um, uh, testing them uh, on a beamline under realistic conditions, and then going back to theory to understand what does the data mean and how do we make use of it. So that gives you just a very brief flavor of what we do at SSRL, and I hope that, um, that many of you become um, involved as users or collaborators with us. So uh, just as my outline here, I'll say a little bit about hydrogen as a fuel, and in particular focus on the issue of energy density, which is uh, one of the things that makes fuel so interesting and important technologically. Um, then I'll talk about uh, a few different technologies that are um, in development or uh, have been under investigation from some, for some time and are being improved. Um, uh, liquid organic hydrogen carriers, I think that's quite an exciting topic. Uh, and low temperature electrolysis with ion selective membrane electrode assemblies. Uh, these two technologies, I think, have the, um, it, as they're developed and made more efficient, have the potential to really um, uh, push hydrogen uh, synthesis in an economically viable direction. Uh, I'll, I'll focus on a specific interest of my group, which is a uh, coated catalyst for water oxidation. And that's part of what happens in this um, membrane uh, electrode assembly electrolysis. Uh, and then um, combining efficient catalysts with high-performance solar cells. So this is an approach to artificial photosynthesis, which could be interested, interesting for distributed production of hydrogen off the grid. And I also want to begin by acknowledging that there are many other uh, PIs at Stanford and SLAC who are involved in these kinds of topics. These are just some of the people um, that, I, that I know of who are working on, um, on hydrogen from renewable sources. Uh, Tom. Uh, Professor Thomas Jaramillo, he's also the director of the SunCat Center. Um, uh, Professor William Chu in, in my department of material science and engineering. Free, uh, professor Friedrich Prinz, he's a professor in mechanical engineering with a joint appointment in MSC. Professor Matt Kanan in chemistry, Hong Ji Dai in chemistry. And then uh, these researchers, Simon Baer, um, Demosthenes Sokaris, uh, both at SSRL, they're both experimentalists who use these techniques to study uh, catalysis that I was just mentioning. And then Frank Abil uh, Peterson, he's a, a SLAC uh, theorist who's interested in, um, in catalysis and uh, particularly uh, related to um, green energy. So uh, if we look at energy density and the, the reason why fuels become interesting or have an advantage, it really is uh, you know, compared to, um, to things like lithium ion batteries, the fact that we can store energy um, either with very high volumetric density, so this is a megajoules per liter on, this, on the vertical scale, uh, or with high specific energy density, that is uh, megajoules per kilogram. So this is something that might be more important uh, perhaps in a vehicle context. Um, uh, this is something that uh, is also important in a vehicle context, but could be um, important in terms of um, other kinds of stationary storage. So we use diesel fuel, for example, as in backup generation because we can store a tremendous amount of energy per unit volume. We don't have to have huge tanks of diesel in order to, to do that. Um, lithium ion batteries score pretty low on, on both of these um, energy density metrics, and that's primarily because you have all that other, in addition, in the, the energy storage is occurring by shuttling these ions around, but you have all this other structure present, as I showed in that cross section of the battery, uh, to support that. So there's a lot of weight and there's a lot of volume that really is not effectively used in the process of storing energy. They have a lot of other benefits as well, obviously, and batteries are a huge and important area of research and, and development, but uh, in this particular metric, they're, they struggle a bit. Um, so uh, if, we, um, if we think about uh, how these kinds of, um, of, of energy density metrics compare to uh, renewable energy, um, for, if, you, if you look at uh, the energy content of 40 liters of gasoline, so uh, a small, um, by U.S. standards, um, gas tank uh, filled with gasoline, uh, that, that has an energy density, of, uh, energy content of about 1,800 megajoules. Uh, and you, you need to run a 20% efficient solar cell, uh, solar panel, 2 meters by 10 meters in area. So this is a big panel for two weeks in order to generate that much energy. So from the perspective of doing things like backing up um, uh, renewable energy that has a high um, uh, temporal variability, 
um, where, where we just, you know, we, we're not producing it in constant quantities throughout the day, um, fuels uh, are an interesting option. Uh, I'll also point out here that in the case of hydrogen, um, hydrogen is, is in some ways the simplest fuel that we can imagine making in terms of the, the chemistry or, or electrochemistry that's involved. Um, the um, the, the uh, specific energy density, of course, is very high because hydrogen is the first element in the periodic table. It's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, um, it's a small mass uh, molecule and uh, it's present uh, in, uh, in all of these um, uh, phases as, as, a, uh, as a, a, a gas at standard temperature and pressure or even as a liquid um, uh, with a relatively low um, uh, density. So it has a specific, um, high specific energy density. Um, uh, the volumetric en energy density uh, tends to be low in comparison to these other fuels, the hydrocarbon fuels. So um, there's a lot of interest in being able to um, come up with approaches to store hydrogen uh, in a form where it has something like liquid hydrogen, like um, uh, volumetric energy density, not so low in, in volumetric energy density. And one approach for doing that is to use what's called a liquid organic hydrogen carrier. Uh, this is, a, this is a, um, an image that I got off the website of a Japanese company called Chiyoda Corporation. They're a leader in this technology. Uh, and their vision is to take different sources of energy, uh, use them to, um, to uh, perform electrolysis uh, on water and uh, create hydrogen, uh, and then uh, effectively uh, hydrogenate uh, a liquid organic molecule. Um, that liquid organic um, uh, host for the hydrogen then can be put into a um, uh, tanker and can move across the ocean as it would if it were full of, um, of an organic fuel. Um, in this case, toluene is the uh, carrier that uh, Chioda is looking at um, for, for the hydrogenation. Uh, and then it's possible to distribute um, that, um, that uh, hydrogenated uh, liquid organic carrier uh, throughout the economy um, to dehydrogenate it where you want to. That might happen at a big plant to produce uh, hydrogen in large scale for industrial processes. It may occur in a localized setting for hydrogen um, filling stations. Uh, in principle, it might be able to occur uh, within a vehicle. Um, you might be able to extract the, the hydrogen and then return the organic carrier. And the idea is then the toluene goes back to the electrolysis facility. Uh, in this case, it's a wind-powered facility that they're showing, uh, or solar, and, um, and you, um, you regenerate it, and the process then continues. So it's, an, it's a very interesting idea. It's not a new idea. Um, the initial work on this was done uh, in the mid-'80s uh, when toluene was studied for this. Uh, more recently, there's been interest in um, a new generations of, of liquid organic hydrogen carriers. One of them is dibenzyl toluene. Um, uh, this particular um, molecule is, uh, is nice because it's possible to do the hydrogenation and dehydrogenation under more um, standard conditions, so not having to go to such high pressures for some of these processes. Um, so we take uh, hydrogen produced through electrolysis uh, add it to this molecule at uh, not, a, not a crazy high pressure. Um, uh, do this over a catalyst, so a ruthenium uh, catalyst on an aluminum oxide support, for example. Um, this is an exothermic uh, reaction, and we can get up to uh, 6.2 mass percent hydrogen, which is a pretty significant hydrogen loading. Um, it gets us a, about um, halfway to the volumetric energy density of, um, of liquid hydrogen. Uh, and then uh, uh, de uh, um, dehydrogenate this material, um, and, uh, and uh, that can be done um, uh, in, over a platinum catalyst um, uh, with aluminum oxide uh, and use the, uh, the hydrogen that, that results from that in a fuel cell or a combustion chamber. So that's the, that's the general cycle of life for this kind of uh, thing and, and would be then reused, as I said before. So I think that's a really exciting technology for a couple of reasons. Um, the, the, the big issue with hydrogen storage is doing it in an energy efficient fashion, not having to, to uh, waste a tremendous amount of energy in uh, pressurizing the hydrogen so that it's sufficiently um, volumetrically dense uh, in energy uh, for, um, for, for many applications. Um, and it's also using existing infrastructure. 
because you can in principle use pipeline and storage infrastructure and shipping infrastructure developed for hydrocarbons with, it, with this approach, uh, it's a way of repurposing all of this very expensive stuff that um, has been developed for, um, for hydrocarbon fuels. Um, the other technology that, that I want to say a bit about is uh, low temperature electrolysis for pressurized hydrogen synthesis. So uh, as, as you saw in that previous um, uh, slide, uh, we do need to pressurize the hydrogen to some extent in order to do this reaction, 10 to 50 bar. Um, and uh, an exciting technology for this uh, is uh, low temperature electrolysis with a, um, a polymer electrolyte membrane um, uh, cell, electrolysis cell. That's what PEM stands for. Um, uh, this is a special kind of polymer that's selective for hydrogen transport. So we flow uh, water uh, liquid water through uh, one of the cells. Uh, there's uh, a reaction that occurs on a catalyst-laden uh, um, coating on this surface of the um, membrane uh, that involves oxidation of the water to make O2 and, um, and to make protons uh, and electrons. The electrons, um, the, the protons are sent uh, through this uh, polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell and then the electrons that are produced um, in this side of the half cell, um, when pushed along by sufficient voltage, will um, will reduce those protons to make hydrogen. Uh, so this is a, a occurring uh, with contact in contact with liquid water. On this side, we can actually have um, uh, the, the hydrogen come out as a gas. So the hydrogen evolution reaction produces H2 in the gas phase, and by providing sufficient overpotential, so sufficiently high voltage here, we can produce hydrogen. Uh, that's pressurized. And this is a really exciting um, innovation, the ability to use what's called the gas diffusion electrode kind of technology to make uh, hydrogen vapor at pressure uh, opens up a lot of po possibilities for economic use of the hydrogen in the kind of scheme we just saw with the liquid organic hydrogen carriers. Uh, the most electrochemically challenging step here in the electrolysis is actually this water oxidation or oxygen evolution process. And that's because we, we need to transfer four electrons per oxygen molecule. So it's a multi-step electrochemical process, and there are significant energy barriers to making it happen. Um, and one of, the, one of the, the real challenges here is finding a really good catalyst. Uh, the, 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 the best and most efficient catalyst, unfortunately, is a very expensive material, iridium oxide. Um, it's, it's really the only efficient OER catalyst that is stable under acidic pHs. And if we're running this thing at high rates and making a lot of protons here, it's going to be relatively acidic conditions. So um, this is one of the uh, challenges, is how do we mo most efficiently make use of, of this iridium oxide and keep it from corroding away or losing it because it is so expensive. Um, just a, a little snapshot of one of these low temperature uh, electrolysis cells. It's actually a stack of different materials. Uh, there, these, um, uh, this, uh, this membrane here is, is a complex uh, material. Uh, the one that's shown here is actually a little bit different where we're allowing uh, uh, water flow um, uh, uh, and, and water generation out the other side of the membrane. Um, but um, in, in any case, this, uh, uh, these, are, these are all you know, you know, highly engineered uh, layers in this stack. Uh, and actually, this whole uh, technology really comes out of the uh, PEM hydrogen fuel cell technology for vehicle fuel cells. So there's a lot of work that's been done that we can reapply to, the, uh, to electrolysis. Um, I'll say a little bit about this um, uh, iridium oxide catalyst. Uh, one of the issues with the catalyst, or any catalyst, is uh, deactivation. Uh, so uh, can we maintain the high activity of, of uh, our oxygen evolution uh, catalyst over time? Um, uh, will it become poisoned by impurities that are present? Uh, in, the, um, in the feedstocks, uh, and um, will it be uh, mechanically robust and stable? Uh, will um, the, the process of oxidizing um, water cause stresses that may um, uh, cause these um, iridium oxide uh, nanoparticles to, uh, to delaminate from the, uh, from the membrane that they're, uh, they're attached to? Um, so one of the approaches for trying to stabilize uh, and protect and prevent um, uh, poisoning of catalysts is to use an overlayer of some kind. And, um, 
and that overlayer uh, could be uh, an active overlayer where something about the, um, the, the combination of the overlayer and the catalyst induces activity uh, for the catalytic reaction on the surface of the overlayer, uh, or it could be an inactive material, but it allows um, the, the correct reactant species to come to this interface uh, and producing the correct product uh, and preventing um, other components that would tend to poison the surface of the catalyst um, from, from entering. So uh, uh, there's a, been a, a lot of interest in these overlayers um, in the literature for various different kinds of catalyzed chemical and electrochemical reactions. One of the things that we've observed, and also a group at Caltech observed right around the same time a couple of years ago, is that if we coat iridium oxide with titanium dioxide, which is a, a normally inactive um, uh, material uh, for water oxidation, um, it, um, it actually enhances the, uh, the catalytic reaction. So we can see that enhancement by measuring the current that's associated with the water oxidation. I said we need, to, we need to transfer four electrons per oxygen molecule, so we can measure the rate of water oxidation by just measuring the, um, uh, the, uh, um, the current that passes. We can see the current is higher for a given potential uh, when we have um, a TiO2 coated uh, with a very thin layer uh, on the order of less than a nanometer thickness of, of TiO2 um, compared to the bare iridium oxide. So this is a very interesting observation. It, it's not uh, uh, necessarily um, indicative of greater stability or uh, protection from poisoning. It suggests that there's actually some kind of an enhancement in the overall um, uh, catalysis as a result of putting this very thin and normally inactive material there. So this, this is not really understood at present, and this is a topic of ongoing research in our lab. Um, and so one of the ways that we can analyze this and study it is using this atomic layer deposition technique, which my group has developed as a way of, of coating materials with very thin coatings. Um, so this is the, uh, um, uh, the kind of chemistry involved. It's, it's really a chemical vapor deposition type reaction where precursor molecules um, uh, come down and react uh, on, a, on a substrate surface or on the, the surface of a, of a growing material. Uh, but the, the mechanism involves uh, sort of a saturated chemisorption of these molecules. Um, and that means that we can make uh, films and coatings that are conformal and pinhole free at very, very thin uh, thicknesses on the order of a nanometer. Uh, and it can be useful in co coating complex surfaces because of this um, uh, self-limiting kind of uh, uh, deposition mechanism, including powders and nanoparticles. So it's an ideal way to, um, to take a, an inactive nanoparticle and coat it with something like iridium oxide, or then coat that with TiO2, as we, we talked about in the previous slide. Uh, our initial studies of the ALD TiO2 coatings on flat iridium oxide films that we've grown on flat substrate surfaces uh, are, are interesting. We've studied this using a technique called uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, uh, using uh, angle resolved measurements. So the, the bottom line from this figure is that um, the, uh, the intensity ratio, the intensities of the photoelectrons that we detect from the overlayer, the TiO2, and from the underlying iridium oxide uh, are such that as we change the angle at which we're measuring these photoelectrons as they come off the surface in this, in this X-ray measurement, uh, it appears that the TiO2 coating is actually uh, a, a uniform thickness uh, closed film, um, so it has a fractional surface coverage of one, meaning that it seems to coat the entire surface. So it's not a, it doesn't appear to be a situation where uh, there are pinholes and cracks and, and, uh, and the, um, the water is able to go through those, react, and the oxygen come back out. It seems like it may be transported through this TiO2 layer itself. Um, that's involved, but we're, we're currently studying that. This is an example of how we can use X-ray tools to uh, say something um, quite uh, interesting and detailed about um, mechanisms. So the, the ALD process is something that we've investigated for various different uh, applications. One of them is uh, taking materials like TiO2 uh, that are normally inactive for water oxidation uh, and using them to protect uh, underlying uh, reactive um, uh, uh, substrates like silicon that are good at absorbing light and, and uh, generating photovoltage that we can use for electrochemistry. Um, 
And then we can coat those with a, an iridium catalyst also by ALD if we wish, as, as I showed previously. And this just gives sort of a, 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 sch a schematic of, of what the, the mechanism of the TiO2 deposition is. Because we can make these films very thin uh, and, uh, and pinhole free, they can um, be uh, effective in protecting silicon uh, without um, absorbing a lot of light or, um, or, um, or being a, a significant electrical resistance uh, between the ca uh, catalyst where we have to um, extract those electrons um, uh, in order to wa um, oxidize water uh, and, the, and the silicon itself. So uh, this kind of uh, structure then can be used uh, uh, to protect uh, a normally uh, a reactive silicon um, uh, photovoltaic material uh, from um, the electrochemical environment involved in, in water oxidation. So these are experiments under very extreme uh, pH conditions. So this is uh, one molar uh, sodium hydroxide, so very basic so electrolyte solution, one molar sulfuric acid. Um, and when we have uh, the TiO2 films or coatings present, uh, we can continually split water uh, on uh, the silicon uh, uh, that's uh, so coated. Uh, but if the coating is not present, um, the current that we measure for water oxidation decays within a few minutes, and that's because we effectively start oxidizing the silicon and building up a very thick SiO2 uh, layer that shuts down the, uh, the flow of current and shuts down the electrolysis. Uh, these uh, um, chrono uh, amperometry measurements show a similar kind of situation uh, if we, um, if we uh, uh, perform them in either uh, ex um, sulfuric acid or, or strong base, uh, we can protect and continue um, water oxidation for, um, for many hours uh, on silicon that would normally fail in just a few minutes. So uh, the last thing I'll say about something about then is this idea of taking these, these highly active catalysts and combining them with a photovoltaic device to make a, um, uh, a uh, sort of a light-driven artificial photosynthesis cell that's capable of generating hydrogen from water uh, in remote locations uh, off the grid. And uh, in doing this, we need to combine the uh, current voltage characteristics of the solar cell uh, with what's called the load curve of the electrocatalyst. So this is the amount of current we can push uh, through during electrolysis uh, as a function of the applied potential. Uh, and uh, ideally, we want this um, this load curve to be very, very steep uh, and, uh, and to cross the, uh, uh, the uh, IV curve of the solar cell at uh, some uh, high current density um, where we can uh, effectively make a lot of, uh, of oxygen and hydrogen uh, per, unit, um, per unit time so we can have a high production rate. Um, the solar to hydrogen efficiency can be calculated in terms of uh, the, the, uh, this short circuit uh, uh, photocurrent here and the, um, uh, the voltage uh, required, the minimum voltage required to split water, which is 1.23 volts, um, and the, uh, um, the uh, incident power of the, uh, of the sunlight. Um, and uh, the initial Department of Energy target for this efficiency is about uh, 15%. That's what uh, the initial um, uh, desired efficiency is for an economically viable, um, you know, sort of pathway to a technology. Um, what we've been able to do is combine uh, silicon um, uh, high efficiency cells, these are um, heterojunction cells called HIT cells, uh, with uh, a, a, um, uh, a built-in electrochemical flow cell um, underneath one of the three series connected silicon HIT cells uh, and uh, obtain uh, at zero external bias, so just driven by the sunlight, a production rate over 10 um, milliamps per centimeter squared of current. Uh, and that uh, corresponds to a solar to hydrogen efficiency of about 13%. So very close to that 15% goal for the, uh, the Department of Energy has, has stated. Uh, and, and, and these um, uh, cells can survive uh, for actually for, for days. Uh, this shows uh, 20 hours of stability but we've been able to test them up past 100 hours of continuous operation. Uh, by using ALD to protect the backside of the um, silicon um, solar cell, where all the, uh, this catalyst is and the electrochemistry is taking place, uh, we're able to uh, get uh, very good stability. This is just an indication of 
uh, the kind of stability results that we've seen. Uh, and uh, the fact that we can, um, uh, in this case, uh, this was, uh, these were up to 24 hours, but we've, as I said, gone up to um, over 100 hours now, uh, 120 hours of stable water splitting, so five days, uh, which is about as long as we, we would do this kind of measurement in my lab. We only have one uh, simulated solar light source to, to use for these kinds of experiments, so we can only keep it tied up for, for so long. Um, another interesting thing about this, uh, if we use the, the ALD uh, TiO2 to protect um, the silicon uh, photovoltaic, we can actually operate over a wide range of, of pH. So we can operate on, with these relatively acidic or basic solutions, which have very low resistance for um, operation. But we can also operate in a, in a buffer solution at pH 7. And this is important if you want to actually develop a technology. Most people don't want to have um, a solar cell uh, with, a, um, uh, with, with a water solution next to it that's concentrated acid or concentrated base. They don't want to have to, to mess with um, these re relatively uh, dangerous um, chemistries. Uh, a pH 7 buffer solution is much more benign. So uh, it will work across a, a wide range of pH if you use the um, ALD protection scheme and the right catalyst uh, for this, um, this kind of uh, structure. So that's uh, really all I had uh, prepared in terms of um, slides. Um, I, could, I could speak to them in more detail, but I thought it would probably be a good idea to, um, to just open things up for questions now, and uh, we can sort of talk about this in a more, um, in a less formal way. So thank you. Um, so I see other, yeah, you can unmute yourself, yeah. Uh, hey, Professor, uh, you mentioned that you could like combust Hydrogen, like using the the gas infrastructure for the hydrocarbons. What are the benefits of like using the combustion process to like you know get your energy back or the fuel cell process? Um, yeah, that's a really good really good question. Uh, generally speaking, um, fuel cells can have higher efficiency than internal combustion engines. Um, the uh, they they have some downsides though. Uh, so if we use, if we take that PEM uh, kind of structure that I showed before for electrolysis, and instead of using it to split water, uh, we use it to react water with, uh, with oxygen to uh, react hydrogen with oxygen to make water, to sort of the reverse process. Um, the, uh, w one of the issues with that is um, you, have, you do have to use quite expensive catalysts in that process. Um, and the uh, and and that's something that you you need to do within every vehicle. So every vehicle has to be fitted out with a fuel cell that has these relatively expensive catalysts. Uh, and there's some um, concern about sort of long-term um, uh, reliability of fuel cells in comparison to IC engines. IC engines have been around forever. People have uh, a century, more than a century of experience with. Um, with how they can uh, fail and how you can uh, reduce the likelihood of that. And they've just gotten much, much better over time. Um, personalized fuel cells are much newer, and they're, they're still sort of on the, the, the learning curve for many of these things. Um, so that, that's probably the major, you know, I would say the major distinction. Uh, in principle, the fuel cell could be significantly more efficient, um, but uh, there's the... Um, sort of the balance of systems costs and then the reliability issues um, that I think still need to be worked out. Um, most likely, uh, these kinds of fuel cells are going to be imp uh, implemented and will, will be seen um, in um, uh, fleet vehicles, um, you know, long haul trucking, maybe uh, buses, uh, and you know, sort of situations where you can imagine um, having to check in uh, as, as a bus goes around its route, having to check into a depot, and if there's, uh, you know, if, if you need to swap the membrane out, there's somebody there who can just do it and then put you right back on the road. It's not so easy to do that for, in, in a personal transportation vehicle. Hi, Anka here from uh, the Hi. GSB, uh, a chemical engineer. Um, I wanted to ask you about, there seems to be a trend um, going against hydrogen and pro, more pro-green ammonia for as a fuel carrier. Um, I was curious if you can talk a little bit about that, if that's also um, a research topic. And I see some 
parallels with the with the catalyst and like the potential for photocatalysis? Um, can you maybe compare and contrast? I'm curious to see. Yeah, I, I think that that's a really exciting area, and I, I don't want to um, uh, minimize the importance of, of other potential uh, energy carriers, um, and uh, certainly green ammonia is one of them. It's it's been a, a, a an area where um, you know the, the catalyst development is probably some years behind that for hydrogen, and so that's where uh, I think if if you, you know that's where real breakthroughs could could come. Um, and uh, you know, synthesis of, of ammonia, um, electrochemical synthesis of ammonia, is is intrinsically interesting from the perspective of agriculture as well. Um, you know, um, ammonia fixation is one of the critical things that allows our contemporary society to exist. Um, and uh, so, I think anything that uh, people can do to understand that better and how, how to do that with uh, renewable energy sources is important, uh, in addition to the potential uh, fuel um, possibilities. So I think that's a really exciting area. I don't work on it myself, but uh, some of the people on that slide that I showed early on uh, do. So I think uh, in particular uh, SunCat, um, which is a uh, center here at Stanford for catalysis research, has several PIs who are interested in that. Hey, um, thank you for your talk. I was curious, so when this technology gets to a place where it can start being used more um, just for, for fuel, for something like long haul trucking, what do you see as kind of the other areas of research that need to be done or things that need to be figured out to make that really viable in our world? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Well, the, the, um, I think that the the whole question of um, this, this the whole production part of it. Uh, so being able to produce it at sufficiently low cost per liter that people are are going to be willing to adopt it um, compared to other approaches. Um, there's the storage and transportation part, and if the liquid organic hydrogen carriers can be you know really used at at scale. Um, with existing petroleum uh, infrastructure, that would be huge. And, and I, I, you know, this, that's a, a, uh, an active field of research. There's a lot of uh, interest in that right now. Um, I, I think that um, in terms of the economic consequences, where we're likely to see this um, have the biggest impact is in things like what you mentioned, long haul trucking, uh, uh, heavy, um, heavy transportation, not probably personal vehicle transportation, because there seems to be a pretty good path for batteries to, to work um, as the, the range um, uh, increases. Um, so, I, I, but I see for, um, for um, sort of heavy transportation, trucking, um, uh, shipping, trains, uh, there's, there's a, a lot of, of that which will be hard to run on batteries just because of the, um, the, uh, the, the necessary specific or volumetric energy density constraints. Um, and perhaps things like um, backing up the grid. Um, although um, uh, what uh, Tom, Tom Jaramillo would say, Professor Jaramillo in chemical engineering is, um, you know, really uh, we need to think about this sort of electrochemical production of protons and electrons, which we do when we make um, hydrogen as an enabler for all kinds of chemistry that we currently do with hydrocarbons. Um, so currently we use you know, hydrocarbons in um, so many different contexts. You know, steel making uses a lot of hydrocarbons. I mean, there's, just, there's so many things around us that we depend on that uh, are gonna be hard to decarbonize. And, but if you have a source of, um, of electrons and protons at the right potential, you can do a lot. Uh, so I think that that's another thing that will naturally come from this research and development is a path to uh, replacing a lot of the chemical synthesis we do today with electrochemical synthesis driven by renewable sources. That's the hope anyway. Uh, yeah. Hello, Professor. So, Hi. Uh, yeah. Catalysis is essentially a surface phenomena. Like if we are using active overlay coatings, like 
how is that not going to hinder the actual potential of that catalysis itself now then we can already shift all together to using that coating only all by itself mm. yeah this is an excellent question so um it 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 turns out that there are uh, the example i showed as i said we don't really understand it yet why why it should boost the performance of iridium oxide to put this normally inactive material there and uh, it, it, it could be that the, the nature of the chemical bonding between the TiO2 and the iridium oxide is such that the, the, effectively the surface of the iridium oxide, the surface bonds are distorted uh, or there, there are structural changes to the surface of the iridium oxide induced by the presence of the TiO2 that make the iridium oxide a better catalyst. Um, but there are other uh, systems in which this kind of um, sort of mutually cooperative effect occurs, uh, and they're often driven by, um, by strain. So if you take one metal nanoparticle and you coat it with uh, another metal that is structurally similar but has a different, um, a different uh, atomic spacing, uh, the coating induces strain on the inner core, particle and the inner core particle induces strain on the outer coating. And that can sometimes lead to very high activity um, because the, the strained bonds that are present um, on the surface uh, actually allow the, the, um, the reactant to, uh, to stick uh, uh, better and to uh, more easily uh, react and, and for the product to come off. So, uh, you know, catalysis depends on having something that's just sticky enough to keep the reactant molecule in place while the, while the, the uh, catalyzed reaction takes place and then, and then releasing the product very easily. And so uh, bond density, um, the uh, chemical identity of what's right at the surface, and um, strain actually all play a role in that, and that's how these coatings may be, um, you know, in some, in some cases, a real game changer. But it's, it's a very ripe area for research right now. And it's hard because you're talking about really nanoparticles. So measuring these things and understanding where every atom is on the surface of a nanoparticle and how that's happening as chemistry is going on, that's really, really hard to do. And that's one of the exciting things about working at a place like SSRL is we have some of the tools to do that. Uh, but there's also a lot of room for theory. Uh, that's necessary to, to understand how these things work. But strain in the coatings, will that not result in mechanical damage? So it depends on how, how much strain you're talking about. And with, nano, with nanoparticles, they tend to, to store strain elastically, whereas, uh, you know, as, as you know, metals that uh, are under strain and are bulk will form uh, defects called dislocations that uh, relieve the strain. Uh, dislocation uh, formation in nanocrystals is much more difficult. Uh, so uh, you can achieve states of strain that are really impossible in bulk materials. This is one of the reasons why nano, uh, nano science and nanotechnology got people excited 20 years ago is that you could, you could do things like that. That's just one example of what these nanostructures uh, uh, allow you to do.